Hello, everyone. Very excited to be on this moving stage today and also to talk about founder mental health. I've been covering startups as a journalist for almost a decade now, and so it's maybe no surprise that people often ask me if I think I would ever like to start a company. And I always say, absolutely no way. It sounds horrible. I've spoken to enough founders to know that it sounds really, really tough. And these two have promised me that they're going to be super honest about the hard moments, because if who here in the audience is a founder, actually? Stick up your hands. OK, so you all know what this is like. And if you're maybe thinking about becoming a founder, you can hear about this and maybe think about it a bit harder. So guys, let's start talking about the impact of running a company on your family and your friends. What happens to those really important relationships when you have this other enormous thing in your life? <laughs> uh, I guess in my case, it, it, it was a continuation of a behavior that I'd been cultivating all my career. Uh, I guess it's in my DNA to bring a certain expectation and a certain level of commitment, a certain gear, if you will, to my work. And so being a founder was, was really, in some ways, not new in that regard, in the sense of a, of a time commitment or in the sense of how much it mattered to me. Uh, from the very beginning of my career, I've always been looking to be full throttle. And so being a, thro being a, a founder uh, for the first time at, at Oyster was the, the most optimal opportunity to bring the fullness of myself that I've always been wanting to bring to my work. But do you think it's not like any other no, there are hard job, is it, being a founder? Yeah. It's, it's more than that. Yeah, the, the, the impact on family in terms of the, the time and the distraction and the attention that you're giving to this thing called work, that by itself wasn't new. There are other aspects that are absol absolutely new. When, when you're a founder, you're standing up and inviting other people, uh, investors to believe in you, believe in the ideas, and that is absolutely new, and I think that is the, the potentially the most impactful aspect to your personal well-being and to the, the themes of this conversation. So I think founder is different, not for, at least not in my case, not for the, the level of work commitment or time or attention, but for the sense of moral responsibility that you're assuming when you say to people, come do this thing with us. Yeah. yeah. Anu, do you feel that as well? I mean, that's what I hear from so many other founders. It's that feeling of you being the, the buck stops with you, right? Like, if you don't sort that thing out, other people might have a harder time. And, you know, you're not, you're not just working hard for you. You also have all these other people and their jobs and their livelihoods. Of course. I mean, that's the mandatory part. You have to... I mean, as a founder, you just have to get yourself in a situation where you actually enjoy that, in addition to that being sometimes horrible. Uh, you don't want to be in charge of all of these things that are impacting other people's lives, but you just uh, kind of like have to find a position where you appreciate it, you understand the privilege also of doing what it, what it really requires. I didn't see myself, uh, I mean, growing up, uh, studying in university, I didn't see myself as a tech entrepreneur as a tech founder. Many people say they've known their whole lives. I think I've some, to some extent been an entrepreneur without a company probably my whole life. But before I actually started Upright, I didn't know I, this is something that I was uh, born to do. And it had a lot to do with role models and nothing to diminish all of the great role models that were existing in the Finnish uh, startup, somewhat small ecosystem when I was studying. But I really couldn't, couldn't uh, see myself there. I, and that's one of the reasons why I now I want to really talk honestly about what it's like, all the pros and the cons, and just uh, share what I've been through. So when it comes to employees or co-founders or other people in the company having a hard time or being unhappy, like how do you, how do you not let that really upset you and harm your mental health as founders? Where's, where's like an appropriate amount to be empathetic and concerned for other people? And where do you have to kind of stop to protect yourself? It can be hard to find that, that threshold, that, that boundary. I can, I can share uh, honestly that 
We started Oyster right before the pandemic. We closed our seed funding、uh, right at the end of 2019, and we're waiting on wire transfers in January and February. And so,、uh, to have the genesis of a of a of a company of your startup coincide with such global scale events that are creating devastation and panic and despair was absolutely extraordinary. And I can share that I I was not successful at keeping that that boundary up.、Uh, thankfully, we were founding a company on the basis of a of a number of important principles. One of those being human centricity.、Uh, as regards our our own people, we were determined to be a fully remote company even before the pandemic made that de rigueur and and standard.、Uh, and we were also quite excited about the opportunity to create a company that was、uh, meaningfully impactful in a social impact way. Oyster is a is a B Corp, and right from the very beginning、uh, of our company, we've had that that commitment to the social impact、uh, opportunity. And so I I leaned on those principles for a sense of purpose and a sense of encouragement. But it was、uh, it was not perfect. I I was absolutely having little breakdowns every other day during you know February and March. I had、um, I booked a, a flight to、uh, to London from San Francisco、uh, in April of 2020 to meet with my my co-founder who was living there and spend some time as part of the beginning of、uh, of starting a company. And I didn't see him until the middle of 2021. So it was a year and a half, which was real tough. But it, but it also gave us the、um, the discipline to be, be the fully distributed remote company that we wanted to be. So it didn't work. I didn't. I was not successful at insulating myself from the perils of、um, of, of mental health. I got fat. I I drank,、uh, and to be honest with you, I, I haven't really gotten back on the health bandwagon. Particularly physically, since this year, from all of that,、and、so I was still reeling and and、uh, experiencing the after effects of all that for several several years after. How what what's helped you get back on back on track? Yeah, it's funny.、Um, I got a new doctor, and with that came all kinds of tests and scores, right? And nothing will inspire you like seeing the actual numbers. Uh, and so that that got me back into better health and better fitness,、uh, and yeah, I'm 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 back now. But it's like four eight, four almost five years later. Anu, how have you how have you coped with things like that, like your own physical well being, and just I guess it's kind of making time for you and prioritizing your own stuff as well, right? I want to comment on the the, the question you asked about. Sort of bearing the impact on on other people because I think this is really interesting and this is something that I've discussed with many founders、uh, who are struggling with this. I think it has to do with the narrative that you have of yourself as a leader. So when I was、uh, growing up, especially so before I found my company in very early in my career, I did some time in management consulting, and、uh, there we worked a lot, like I do today as well. And I had this narrative for myself that when I get to be a project leader. I will be the most amazing project leader, and everybody will be 100% happy in my team all the time. And then, when I finally、uh, got the chance to be a project leader, I made my all of my efforts, obviously at the expense of my own well-being, as as you all do,、uh, to make sure that they would have a better experience in terms of lifestyle and all of these things, and to be an amazing coach. And then、uh, the next project that、uh, one of the juniors that、um, was working in my team, the next project, he went to another country. Came back,、uh, got really sick, and it was a horrible experience for him. And I understood that、uh, there is something sort of、uh, there is something very deep in me that wants to have this narrative that I am the sort of I will make everybody feel amazing. And obviously, starting my own company, this was only like 10x from that.、Um, but the biggest lesson that I've gotten for this hasn't come from any fancy business book or even any fancy well-being book or anything like that, or even coaches and therapy. It's come from this poster. That was in the kitchen of the co-working space. So before, when we got started with Upright, before we could afford to actually rent an office, we're working in a co-working space because we got like a free pass or something. And there was a poster in the kitchen whenever I went to get some tea in between my meetings and calls that says,、uh, "You cannot make everyone happy. You are not pizza." And there was a huge picture of a pizza in that. And that has been my single biggest leadership sort of、uh, help 
and uh, something that's kept me sane. And I, I think there's something pretty profound in that pizza saying, and I, I come back to it every day. And I think it has to do with also trying to make everybody happy in your team. Trying to make it, we're, making, we're solving an impossibly difficult problem. We are trying to save the world and build an incredibly successful SaaS company at the same time. And I'm trying to kind of steal away from these ambitious, talented, driven people who are working in my team. I'm trying to like steal away from them their right to also struggle at times. So when I realize this thing, especially with some of the people that I work very closely with that are in my team, whenever they're struggling, I almost feel this urge to like, <gasps> let me take this away from you. Let me, let me make you feel better. Let me solve this for you. And then that's when my skills in mothership actually come in hand, because the first thing you should never do to a child or anyone, actually a person near you, is to steal an experience from them. And that's helped me tremendously to understand that it is unrealistic that people in my team would grow to be the amazing professionals they are born to be if I were to steal every hard, hardship from them. And that helps me today to keep saying, it still hurts, it's horrible. Whenever someone's struggling, whenever someone's really disappointed with themselves, it, it hurts me physically. But I found a way to kind of uh, uh, understand that it's a part of the journey and I have no right to take it away from them. That's a great insight. And when it comes to when you are struggling, how do you cope with that? Because I think you, we spend so much time, don't we, at events like this, um, when you're pitching to investors, when you're pitching to potential employees, you're always pitching. You're pitching the big vision. You're pitching how amazing this company could be. But it's not. It's like so many ups and downs, isn't it? Who, who do you talk to? Where's your safe space? You know, you can't... You, no matter how much investors say they're founder-friendly, like you're not going to always talk to your investors, are you? You're not going to always talk to your co-founder, especially if they're the one who's being a pain in the ass. Like... How do you deal with that loneliness of being in the middle of everything? You may not have that person in your life. You may not have that, that outlet. I'm grateful that in my amazing co-founder, Tony, I, I have not just an extraordinary entrepreneur, but a, a great friend. I was just visiting him at his, his new home in, in Cyprus right before I came here. And that's a long way to go. And I can say that part of the reason that I, that I love spending time with him is, is precisely so that we can have those kinds of fully open, fully available, fully naked conversations. And so I'm, I'm lucky to have that. I also have an amazing and supportive uh, spouse that's, that's been on a, a long, multi-decade journey with me so far. It certainly made surviving the adventure of starting a company during the pandemic possible. So I, I'm, I'm lucky and uh, I, I recognize that not everyone may have uh, that outlet. It's a sort of thing where part of the entrepreneurial journey may be at first taking an inventory of the resources and the people that you have in your life and getting them ready to support you. I, I didn't think of that in, in hindsight. I'm sure glad that I had those people um, but I, I would say, think about that. Think about who your go-to people are so that when you're facing those difficult moments that you, you, can't, you can't bring that, that genuine face to other employees or to investors, to the people that you have to hold up a kind of facade to, that you have that alternative, that, that place where you can be your authentic self. Anu, how have you navigated that? It's very unnerving when that moves. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, I think this is a really, really important topic to raise um, in case anyone in the audience is also struggling to figure out who's my mentor, who's going to help me do this. I think the honest truth is not many people have like a magical mentor that helps them through everything. Or probably, probably no one really does. If, if you're really, you know, gone through a lot of hoops, you just learn to... And you, you have to embrace the loneliness. And this is not to sort of not be grateful to all the great people, obviously, around me. But I used to think for a long time, like, I don't really have a mentor mentor that I would go call. I even have people who are amazing would help me, but I struggle to call them. And I thought, what, what the hell is wrong with me? Why am I not reaching out to these people? Why don't I have? I, I, I even thought at some point, because uh, in the sort of culture that I was growing up in, everybody talked about mentors and sponsors. And I was like, I don't know who those are for me. I, I, I don't know. It's just like me and my weird obsession of, you know, saving the world with impact data or something like that. 
Uh, and I think it's really important to also hear that it's fine and it's most likely you don't have one magical person. For me, when it comes to this whole co-founder and spouse thing, so how I have done, and I can recommend this to absolutely no one, so please do not do like I have done. So uh, how life has taken me to a wonderful place is that I have a crazy situation where I have absolutely all my eggs in the same basket. So my spouse is also my co-founder, or my co-founder is also my spouse. We have a kid together. Um, we have a motto which always helps us through whatever situation, uh, which is too big to fail. So everything we put in the same basket, this is a too big to fail kind of situation. We cannot afford to not get along <laughs> because of the company, because of the kid, because of everything. I'm joking, obviously, it's okay to laugh. Uh, so for, so for, some reason, uh, for some reason, we have, and I don't know what kind of uh, gods of the startup ecosystem I should be thanking, but we have been... Um, it's been going really, really well. Uh, and one of the reasons is, obviously, being a female founder, this is a topic I run into all of the time, the question about, can you start a family? Can you really match it with really growing an ambitious company at the same time? So I became a mom during the pandemic, uh, and it's always been crystal clear for us, for me and my, my co-founder and my spouse, that our number one priority is our kid, and then comes the company. And it's actually, it has saved us so much energy from not having to negotiate and have all of these discussions about your career, my career. Like, none of this exists for us. It's just a clear priority whenever the kid needs us, one of us goes. If she really needs us, both of us go. And then we take care of the company. And it's, it's really, really sort of, uh, it's, I don't know, refreshing and very uh, clear for us to, to kind of like have this crazy setup that I, again, would not recommend, but now, having ended up in it, I kind of love it. Are there other relationships, whether it's friends, siblings, that have been affected by running a company and being so 120% focused on this thing that sucks so much energy? Um, I'm originally from New York, and I have most of my family there, and... Um, I certainly neglected them beyond the degree that I would have liked to have uh, during, the, during the genesis of the company, aggravated certainly by the, the challenges and the difficulties of the, of the pandemic. So I was, um, I was meaningfully estranged from my family, missed things that say I, I would have liked to have been a closer, a closer part of. And that's something that I'm kind of working on now. Uh, as soon as the pandemic made it possible, I had a, a, a nice trip with my older brother who lives in New York, Stephen, and he and I uh, went to some of the national parks, Zion and the Grand Canyon and Bryce, and really had a, a bonding that I don't think would have been possible but for the estrangement and the sacrifice that I made to our closeness and to our relationship. The good news is I, I was bringing a, a different, hopefully better version of myself as a result than I would have otherwise. But yeah, I miss things and, and I, I let closeness lapse, which is uh, you know, costly in, in the grand scheme of life. Anu, do you, or do you have any kind of... Um, you were talking about if you were going into it again, you'd sort of do a bit of a checklist. Are there things, are there kind of good habits you've got into with close friends perhaps, or where you've said, you know, th this is all I can give you, or, you know, th this is what's currently going on with me, it won't be forever, but, you know, are there any, I guess I'm thinking of advice for people who might be navigating that, maybe it's feeling of guilt of not being able to spend enough time with a good friend, or their spouse, or their kid, or their parent, because the company is so everything. Yeah. This is just, oh, sorry. No, I, I was just <laughs> going to say that, that the exercise of creating a company can be alienating from other people, but there is a perspective through which it also brings you closer when you realize that everyone in some way is trying to realize a dream, trying to make something a reality in their own life, and it is all or nothing, that they are really fully committed. It may be different, uh, but it also gives you a basis of, of commonality, a way to bring compassion, and understanding to others who, if you look closely enough, 
are in fact working on their own thing or things rather passionately and intensely. I found that to be useful in, in bonding with other folks from other walks of life, useful in serving as a basis for new friendships. Well, for me, I think it's all about, I, I, I don't think the hustle and, and hassle in my life started with founding a company. I've been somewhat sort of uh, on steroids since I was probably six years old or something. So I think, I think there are like certain things you just, how I've been running my calendar, if, if, if that's a sort of, a, yeah, well, it, it, it may sound sort of brutal, but that's how it works. Uh, is that I just first fill in the stuff that really matters to me, and those are my non-negotiables. There are not a lot of them, let's be honest. I have a bunch of my really close friends who I always prioritize. I need to be planning ahead a lot. Like, I block in time for them. I obviously block in time for my daughter every day. And uh, other things that are important for me. Because the work will just take the rest, and it's fine. And I love my work, I love everything about it. But if I don't plan that way, I, don't, I've, I haven't measured how many hours I work in the past 15 years because it just takes whatever is left. What I measure is that I get done the other things that matter to me, uh, like my close friends who I appreciate year after year more and more, the older I get. Uh, when it comes to my daughter, she's my number one life hack. So anyone struck, like figuring out if you can combine a kid and a sort of highly ambitious growth company, you can, it's tough. But it's, for me, I couldn't do this without my kid. So she's my number one life hack when I come home, I'm, I, when I walk from the office I'm, or airport or whatever, I'm full of like everything's in my head. But as soon as I open the door, she's there. She doesn't even say hi. She said, let's start to build a hospital and a hotel out of magnetiles. And I start to build the magnetiles. Uh, and it takes me less than six seconds to be completely off all of this. And this is my sort of secret hack of, of being sane. And to your question about guilt, it's very real. I, I was, wasn't actually expecting it. When I became a mother, I thought it's, uh, I'm going to somehow like, uh, escape it because I had no expectations of what kind of a mother I'm going to be and so on. But it's re very real, it's almost like something biological. Um, how I handle that is by actively telling myself that, you know, um, not, not really buying into this, I'm a bad founder because I'm not working on this right now, I'm a bad mother because I'm not with her, because you're obviously all the time you're doing one, one sacrifice or the other but telling myself that I'm a, I'm a great mom, I'm actually a better mom because I'm a founder, I'm actually a better founder because I'm a mom, and this, this really uh, sort of uh, plays well together for me. Jack, yeah. do you have any, I mean, I love that kind of put in all the important stuff that isn't the company first, and then the company can fill the gaps. Yeah. Do you have any other kind of uh, hacks like that? Please don't tell us you get on Peloton at 5 a.m. in the morning <laughs> no. or something like that. No, no, not at, not at 5 a.m., although I, I do try to <laughs> squeeze some sort of physical activity in at the beginning of the day. I think that that dramatically recharacterizes the, uh, the um, complexion of the day thereafter, so that's certainly uh, a tip. On the point of guilt, uh, probably when I feel the worst is when I'm reacting to stress or anxiety or pressure from the work world, and I'm bringing that to people who don't deserve it, right? And only because they're the ones who are there in, in my life or in the room, as it were. And, and I would, it's, it's, it's a struggle. I mean, it's hard to compartmentalize, particularly when, as part of being a founder, as we mentioned earlier, it's, I wouldn't call it a facade, because that feels like it's fake. It's, when you are, and this is, what's, this is what's different, right? Like I said, it's not the time. It's not the time commitment. It's not the intensity. I'd already been working that way. What, what's most different about being a founder is you are a kind of moral guarantor. You know, particularly the people that you've said, hey, come and, come and be a part of this thing. It's going to be all right. And so for them, you, you are absolutely trying to stand up the best possible version, you in the face of their own troubles, their own stresses, their own anxieties. And so I feel most guilty when I've done that and it's family and friends and the other people who you know, get the reality thereafter. That's the worst, that's the worst feeling. And I, I, I don't have any, any specific advice for meeting that challenge other than sharing an awareness of that, uh, that danger with you. Uh, you know, it happens and that's when I feel absolutely the worst, you know, when like I'm snippy with my wife or, and it's completely unrelated, you know, she's just trying to be supportive and, you know, yeah. so I hate that, I hate that. Anu, how do you, 
how do you cope with situations like that where you're just, you're having a shit day or like, you know, some deal fell through or something's gone wrong and your, you know, your team can, they can see it, can't they? They can feel it. And as you said, you're kind of meant to be the, mm. the puppy or the mascot or the person who's always bringing the good energy, aren't you? Like, how do you navigate that? Yeah. That I think is probably the most sort of interesting and something that surprised me the most about being a founder. Many of the things are just over, sort of also dramatized before. I think being a founder is amazing. It's, uh, you know, it, it's a great job. But the loneliness that has to do with not actually being able to show all of that is something that's been, I guess, still a, probably the biggest surprise for me. It has to do when something goes bad and I feel like shit. Um, as you said, it is, it is my, my job to basically continuously maintain our stamina, our excitement, our belief in something that is extremely difficult to solve, which we're doing not just for us, not just for ourselves to get rich or whatever, helping our customers, but actually also to help like, the world around us. It's, something, it's my duty to keep everyone uh, very focused, also, also in the very difficult times, but it doesn't happen like, hey, it doesn't matter, let's move on. That's, that's, uh, like, that's fake. Uh, no one would, would follow that. They would just like, oh no, I don't know, she's tripping or she's just trying to get us, she's not even actually relating to us, she's just like trying to skip on, on top of the, or like beyond the, the bad stuff, the uncomfortable stuff. So you need to be really, uh, you need to at the same time be very authentic and show yourself and then not show yourself. Because at the same time, the moments when I don't believe, I cannot really show that to anyone. And I think that's something that uh, sometimes not even my co-founder, even though we are basically like a, a crazy one unit. But um, the whole idea of being a founder is that your table is messy. And if you actually showed everything on it, you would not be doing your job correctly. So while at the same time, you need to embrace things like transparency. And I, I have my routines of like, I have my three plus three, like what's keeping me up at night? I'm sharing it with the board. I'm sharing it with the team. I have all hands sessions where I share what's, you know, you know, what's, what I'm struggling with and so on. But at the same time, uh, you just simply need to like, find a way to understand that your personality and what you represent to the company is not the same as you. It is in the beginning when you're like a team of 15, fine. But at least for me, something changed after 20. And you simply need to find a way to understand that there's this Anuni Eminen, who's the founder of CEO, who's not really me, who's like this persona. At the same time, as I need to be authentic. And this is the paradox. I need to be authentic. I need to show up exactly like I am. But at the same time, I need to use this vehicle where I think about what does the company and what does the person here need from Anuni Eminen, which is not really me. And almost like speaking about yourself in the third persona. May sound totally crazy. I don't know how other people sort of navigate this. But for me, it's helped a lot to understand that there are expectations towards me. There are jobs I need to do that don't actually have anything to do with who I am as a person deep down. And this is something that I think is a requirement of handling high growth, uh, a team that is ambitious and is bound to both make it and then also fail on a regular basis in s small and sometimes bigger things. Yeah, that's certainly true, um, especially when your identity becomes bound up in the role of a founder. You can, you can lose yourself and, and may not realize that there's a, there's a cost, uh, there's a cumulative cost of that over time as you, as you uh, integrate that as part of your, your I identity. Yeah, amazing. We are almost out of time, but thank you so much for being so honest and so open. And thank you. do you have any final, final one minute, 20 seconds words of advice or just comfort for people here who might be finding it all a bit tough? No, I have to say, I, I think the most, even though now we've been talking about the struggles, trying to be honest about them, my main message still is, there's so much of just dramatic talk about how tough it is to be the founder. It is tough, and you're probably the right, if you're thinking about it right now, if you're the kind of person who's always just been working super hard, not, not um, you know, afraid of any kind of obstacle, and willing to take the heat and take the pain, go for it. This is the best job I've ever had, and I don't think there's any going back for me in this life. Look for the joy in, in, in that experience. Look for those moments when you can feel uh, exhilaration. Bringing something that doesn't exist into existence is profound and a, certainly a, a tremendous opportunity for joy and fulfillment. You will, you will experience those moments alongside. We focused on the negative and the perils here, 
but there is a there is a degree of exhilaration and joy in the making that is involved with entrepreneurship that I would recommend to anyone. There's a reason people found more than one company, isn't there? Yes. Yes, definitely. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Andy.